We've talked about locking down the router. Now it's time to lock down the Catalyst switch. Welcome to the device security section on Catalyst switches. This is the first of a few where we're going to focus in on the layer two fabric of our network. Now the first question I have to answer when we get into here is why layer two? Why do we really even need to focus on layer two security? I mean, you figure if somebody's in the building, then they're in, right? They should be able to access the network. We'll then talk about some common or simple layer two attacks. We're going to expand on this a little bit more later as we get into some of the uh, more complex attack, and this is going to be in, in future videos that we can defend against. And then finally, we'll configure the Catalyst port security. This is the built-in features that every Catalyst switch comes with that most people forget about. If you were to plan a road trip somewhere, what would be your concerns? I mean, if you were going to take a you know, a fairly decent long road trip, what, what kind of things would you consider? Well, I mean, things like, do I know how to get there? Does my car have enough gas? Does the oil need to be changed? Does my car work properly? I mean, all of these thoughts may come to your mind, but you never really consider, is the road going to be there as I drive? Or is the road going to have a massive hole in it as I drive through to get to my destination? I mean, those kind of thoughts. I mean, sure, now that I mention it, you're like, well, I guess I could throw that in there. But you just kind of assume it's going to be okay. And that's what most people think about when they think about data link layer security. They don't even worry about it. Why worry about layer two? I mean, you've got your switches. They're the road of your network. Everything is just plugging in there. I mean, we're really focused on the advanced attacks. I mean, things like, you know, is this port secure or a worm tunneling its way into that application layer of our OSI model? When we think about network security at layer two, we think of these. We've got our catalyst switches. The road is there. People are traversing the road. Life is good. We've almost had this unassumed sort of paradigm that, you know, if somebody can get into our building and plug into a Cat5 Ethernet jack, then you know what? Kudos for them. We're going to find them very quickly, but, you know, maybe they'll get an IP address. That's okay, because we still have our upper layer security that, that can, you know, protect against that. And that's been the paradigm that all these people have been in for a long time. It's like, you know, if they can physically get to a wall jack, then, you know, okay, they passed our firewall. They're, they're, they're into our network. And what really, I think, in my opinion, changed everybody's opinion on that was these guys. <laughs> wireless access. When wireless access came out, I mean, it just wasn't secure. You had your WEP, but within moments of WEP being released, there was all these hacking methods that could slice through WEP keys like nothing. Only recently has wireless matured enough where people are saying, oh, okay, that's, that's secure in and of itself. But it was when wireless came out that people really turned an eye to layer two security. And that's surprising. Because hacking tools have been out for years before wireless to take down these layer two switches. We just kind of assume they didn't exist. We turned a blind eye to them. Nobody uses those. And I mean, if they're in the building, then, you know, then they deserve to be there and all that sort of stuff. We kind of trust the people inside of our network. The problem with that mentality is, well, just the way the OSI model was designed. The OSI model, you can see right here, is designed where every layer is pretty much autonomous. You know, the physical layer does its thing, and the data link layer assumes the physical layer is okay, and the network layer assumes the data link layer is okay. So they're all, they, they're all built on this basis of assumption to where the network layer doesn't really check to make sure the data link layer is doing its job. I mean, that's the way the OSI model was written. But with that sort of logic... If somebody can compromise the data link layer, well, then none of the other layers are going to know about it. It's kind of the weak link in the chain. If this layer 2 falls, all the layers on top of that layer 2 are going to fall with it. And you may or may not know about it. So even though network security at layer 2 has really uh, taken the limelight when these wireless access points came out, well, it's been out for years to be able to implement on your catalyst switches. It's just most people forget about it. Let me give you an example of a layer two attack that has been out for years. On the left hand side, you have your normal computers, employees doing day to day stuff. On the right hand side, you have your intruder. 
And as a side note, if you're ever walking by somebody's cubicle and there's kind of this shady red glow that just casts this shadowy appearance on them, and they look like they're working on bar charts or something like that on their screen, don't believe it. Just shut off their network port right there. That's that's obviously an evil person. Now, this person could be plugged into that switch on any given port and run a program called DSNIFF, D-S-N-I-F-F. -F. It's been out for years on Linux and was ported over to Windows platforms, so those script kiddies who don't even know what they're doing can unleash a major network attack. DSNIF is originally designed as kind of like a suite of hacking tools. Uh, well, <laughs> auditing tools is the politically correct term, uh, where you can kind of sniff what's going on. But inside of there, there is a program that can generate packets with multiple source MAC addresses. It's called MACOF. I call it MacOff, but it's missing an F. Um, what this program does is flood the switch with MAC addresses on a single port. So in this, this red, guy, uh, red guy's cubicle, he's actually sending thousands of packets every second into the switch with different source MAC addresses. Now, if you understand how the switch works, the switch is constantly learning MAC addresses. That's its job. So as it sees these different sources, it's going, oh, there's another computer there. I'll add that to my cam table. There's another computer there. I'll add that to my cam table. It just keeps adding it. Now, the cam table on an average Cisco switch, and I'm talking like you can see on the screen, a 2950, uh, 3550 sort of range, can hold a cam table can hold about 130,000 MAC addresses. That's a lot. Okay, so there's there's plenty of memory out there, but this program MacOff, the the one that's a, as part of the DSNF suite, can generate guess how many? A hundred fifty five thousand MAC addresses per minute. That means within one minute of somebody running that program on that switch port, your cam table is completely full on the Cisco switch, which leads us to the next question. Okay, what's the switch do when its cam table is full? The answer, become a hub. The switch kind of goes into this failover mechanism, which says, ah, my, my cam table's out of memory. I'll just send everything everywhere. And immediately, you've reduced that switch down to a hub, which means the red glow cubicle hacker can now open their packet sniffer, like ethereal or something like that, and capture data from the entire network. They'll see your communication with your servers, your routers, your switches. All of that will be captured by that end user. So they can go through and analyze all of the information that you are sending across your network. Now, in the worst case scenario, you'll never know about it. And I say that's the worst case because your switch has just been turned into a hub, but unless you're really watching what's going on in the network, you're not going to notice. I mean, you're going to get less performance out of that switch because it's sending everything everywhere. But at the same time, you know, maybe nobody knows. And you have that red cubicle hacker that's going to be sitting there auditing your network, gathering all the information for days, weeks, months. It could even go further than that. Um, all the time capturing sensitive data, doing whatever they want with it. This attacker can also do something called MAC address spoofing. And all that is, it's easy enough to do, you can assume the identity of another computer on the network. And if you're good enough, pull off a man-in-the-middle attack, meaning that you maybe assume the identity of one of the major servers that's plugged into your network over here, so the switch believes that you have the MAC address for that server. Now, if you're good enough, people will be sending information to the server, you'll route it through your workstation, back out, and send it to the server, so nobody knows it's happening. A very amateur man-in-the-middle attack is, <laughs> I guess, not really a man-in-the-middle, it's just a man <laughs> who uh, intercepts the communication and doesn't forward it on. Whereas a sophisticated man-in-the-middle attack will take that information and then forward it on to the server to where nobody knows that the man in the middle is even there. The, unsophisticated, the unsophisticated attack disrupts network communication, so they'll be noticed at some given point. The more sophisticated attack is as transparent as a fly on the wall. After seeing that, it should be a relief to you to know that Cisco switches out of the box can protect against those kind of attacks. 
It's just that most people forget to turn on that kind of security. There's two ways to stop those common layer two attacks, and one is using secure MAC addresses, and I'll talk about the three different kinds of MAC addresses. The other is to limit the number of MAC addresses per port. Now, in doing this, you not only gain the benefit of stopping MAC address flooding attacks, but you also stop those people from building little mini networks in their cubicles, people that bring in their own little hubs and switches at home, and can potentially introduce spanning tree loops and rogue devices into the network. So let's start with that one, limiting the number of MAC addresses per port. All you need to do on your Cisco switch is to go under the port that you would like to limit this on. And I'll go ahead and use interface fast ethernet 0 slash 21. I actually have that connected uh, in this little mini network back here to a hub that has just a single device attached. So on this port, I'm going to type in a couple of things. First off, switch port mode access. Now we'll talk about the default, which is dynamic desirable uh, when we get into the next video. Uh, it's a horrible default, but the access is the mode that it must be on in order to do port security. Um, access says that this is an access port and the port will only connect to a end network, meaning it won't be a trunk port connecting to another switch. It'll connect to a PC or a hub, but everybody's on the same VLAN. Now the first thing we need to do is type in switch port port security. That's a commonly forgotten one which turns on port security for that switch port then we get to type in our switch port port security commands and I'll type in first off maximum and I'll just say one to limit this port to a maximum of one MAC address now I can verify that configuration just by jumping out here and typing in show port security um, and we'll type in interface fast ethernet 0 slash 21 you can see that right here maximum MAC addresses oops uh, is one and the total MAC addresses is one. The last one that's been on there is that MAC address and that is uh, in VLAN 100, that's the one it's configured. That's the one device I have plugged in. Now, you also see right here the violation mode. The default violation mode when you turn on port security is shut down. Let me jump back under that interface, uh, fast user at zero slash 21, and do switch port, port security, violation, so you can see the three modes. Shutdown is pretty obvious. If you violate the policy, it's going to shut down the port. In my opinion, it's one of the best because you absolutely know when somebody shuts down a switch port. It's not that you're, you know, very good at view reviewing all of your logs and seeing that it's that you're going to get a phone call if somebody goofs up and plugs multiple devices into a switch port you're going to hear a call because they can't get their work done anymore their port has been shut down and you get to chastise them and have your own little uh <laughs> power thrill for a moment and be like what are you doing and you, you feel it, it's horrible but every administrator lives for the moment they get to chew out a user um but uh you know you you get to know exactly when it happens because you're going to get a phone call Call. The other two you may not know. First off, I would completely recommend that you do not use protect. Protect is a mode where it will, uh, when another MAC address adds on above the one that's already on there, above the, the maximum MAC addresses that you've added, it just ignores the other MAC addresses, meaning your port security is still in effect, but you don't know when somebody violates the policy. You'll never be told either. Um, restrict is the one that I would recommend. If you're not so drastic that you want to shut down the port, use restrict, which does exactly the same thing as protect. But whenever somebody does violate your policy, this little counter right here will tick up by one. It'll say, oh, Policy violated. Security violation, one. And you'll also see a, a log message if you had logging turned on. Um, you know, second one, you'll see two in that, the, that list. So even though you're not shutting down the port, you'll at least realize and have a counter to verify when somebody is violating the policy. Now, keep in mind that if you do have protect or restrict turned on, if somebody plugs two MAC addresses into the port and realizes that one of them is not working, they can unplug that one and then plug in the other one and allow that one to work. That may or may not be a good thing in your network. So, you know, when they realize that, say, this MAC address 
is the only one that works. If they disconnect that MAC address, they will go to a total of zero, and then the Mac, next MAC address that they plug in will take it back up to one. So those are the different ways that you can do that. Now, I'll, I'll go ahead and leave it on a default state of shutdown for the switch port port security because I have my Macintosh which is a good hacking machine. And I'm going to take this and plug this. This will be the second device that I add to that switch port. Let me just go ahead and uh, plug that one in. Oh, good grief. Uh, just as I plug that in, I, one of the devices that I was using was, uh, oh, good, good. It have sorry, I just turned around and looked at my screen to see all this. Look at this. As soon as I plugged in my MAC address, it says, Port security violation occurred on fast ethernet 0 slash 21. I'm putting it in the error disable state. So immediately you can see that the line protocol has been changed to down and fast ethernet 0 slash 21 is now down. So if I hit the up arrow and do that show port security, you can see that the port status is secure and it has been shut down. So don't look at enabled and think, oh, well, my port's enabled. That means it is actually down. And if I do a show IP interface brief, um, and look right here at fast ethernet 0 slash 21, it just shows up as down. So by looking at that port in this state, you're just going to think, oh, well, it's just down. There must not be anything plugged in. But if you type in show interface fast ethernet, oh, did I, oh, 0 slash 21, you will see that the port is error disabled. That means either you have some kind of duplex mismatch that's caused that, or you have a security violation that has shut the port down. I also know that many of you are like me and love commands like show IP interface brief where you can see what's going on with your switch ports all in one quick glance. Well, there's another command I want to show you that's similar to it. It is show interfaces and do status. And don't, you don't need to specify an interface. <laughs> now you get to see my home. But uh, you can see that all of these different interfaces are plugged in. I have brief descriptions, so this is a good way to know um, what those switch ports are. But look at the status column right here. There. As we go down, we can see what's connected, what's not connected, and which ones are error disabled. So you've gone, you've chastised your users and flogged them appropriately. How do you get that port back up? Well. There's no quick way to do it. The, the main way that you can go in is uh, go under that port. We'll say interface fast ethernet 0 slash 21. Do a shutdown and then do a no shutdown. Just typing in no shutdown will not re-enable that port. Oh, <laughs> I still have my, Mac, uh, my Macintosh plugged in. So I'll plug that, uh, unplug that quickly so that it uh, doesn't shut itself down again. But now when I go back and do that show interface status, you can see that it is restored and it's connected again. So that's, that's how you can restore the uh, down port. Now, it's not part of the official Cisco uh, test prep curriculum. So if you're studying for the exam, don't worry about this stuff I'm about to show you. But there is a... Another method that not many people know about on Cisco switches. Now I'm going to type in show error disable followed by recovery. There's this feature that Cisco switches have called error disabled recovery that after you can see all these different states that will cause an error disable. Uh, we just saw security violation as one of the reasons. Um, but we have you know channel misconfig that's like an ether channel where we have flapping links where we I mean there's all kinds of things that can cause the error disable state. We can configure our switch to re-enable the port after a certain amount of time. Now you can see that default amount of time is 300, but error disable recovery is turned off by default. So you can see they're all disabled. So even though it says uh, recovery will be in 300 seconds, it's not gonna be in 300 seconds unless you turn it on. So you can go into global configuration mode and type in error disabled recovery, um, type in a, a specific cause that you wanna look for, and you can see all of these uh, timers to recover from some violation. We'll say security violation right there. So SEC tab, and you can say, I wanna enable recovery for that. You can then type in the error disable uh, recovery interval 
and specify how many seconds you want to force the port to be shut down before it recovers itself. So now when I jump back here, I'll type in show error disable recovery. You can see now that we are enabled for security violations. So if I were to plug in my Macintosh into this port and connect that thing up, it's going to cause the violation but now a little counter has begun in the background that's going to recover the port within th in 300 seconds for that violation. Um, that may save you a couple phone calls, um, but overall, you know, it's primarily useful for some of the other ones. Usually, security violation, you want it to stay down. Um, so, uh, last thing I want to show you on this this note, I'm going to type in show port security fast Ethernet. Oh interface fast ethernet at 0 slash 21 um, and you can see right here we do have a security violation counter that is ticking now I shut down and, and unshut down the port and powered up the port so it reset that counter but this counter will continue to tick however many security violations you have on a given interval so that's one that you can always refer to uh, to see what's going on now that's the limiting of MAC addresses per port last thing I want to talk about is secure MAC addresses by default all your switches will learn dynamic MAC addresses that's just what they do and that's the default MAC address type now we can transform them from dynamic MAC addresses over to static or sticky MAC addresses now static MAC addresses are pretty straightforward. I'm going to go back under the uh, interface fast ethernet 0 slash 21 and uh, let's let's do um, let me first off do switch port port security I'll do a maximum of 10 uh, just to allow me to plug multiple devices in there but first way I can I can configure static MAC addresses by typing in switch port port security uh, MAC address and just type in whatever MAC address I want I've seen a lot of government agencies use this to where they can type in uh, the specific MAC address allowed on that port and no other MAC address will be able to access that if you are going to use the static MAC address method and say you know my MAC address was this be sure to couple it with the maximum MAC address command. Uh, now, I just showed you, I just cranked it up right on the screen above us to 10 MAC addresses. If I statically type in MAC addresses and say, you know, 111111, and that's the only MAC address I want on that port, then make sure you change the maximum to 1. Because if I leave it at 10, it will allow only that 111111 and nine dynamic entries. It's kind of a combination of static and dynamic. So it will allow whatever uh, static ones I have typed in plus whatever the maximum buffer is uh, to the maximum number of MAC addresses I'm allowing on that port. Um, so type in however many MAC addresses you want and then set the maximum. The second way that we can do this is by taking a calculated risk. Now you can see right below here I have sticky. Uh, sticky MAC addresses is your way of allowing the switch to do the work for you. You can imagine how difficult it would be in a network of a hundred or a thousand PCs to sit there and type in all the MAC addresses of those PCs into the ports. I'm not saying it can't be done, and I'm not saying it's very beneficial if you are paid by the hour. However, if you're, if you're salary, you don't want to sit there all night typing those things in. So you can take a calculated risk, and that's using the sticky keyword. What will happen when you use sticky is the switch will automatically hard code any MAC address that you have plugged into that point port into the running configuration. And as soon as you save that to the startup configuration, that is set permanently. Let me give you an example. I'm, I'm going to first off do, uh, before I type this command in here, I just hit enter. I'm going to type in do show run interface fast ethernet 0 slash 21. And we can see that as of right now, we have the port security turned on and the maximum is set to 10. Now, I'm also going to type in do show MAC address table and I'll focus in on interface fast ethernet 0 slash 21. And you can see as of right now, oh, do I have both of those plugged in? Oh, no, I just have, uh, have not cleared it out since I plugged both MAC addresses in. Let me just uh, plug and unplug that port real quick and uh, give it a sec to cycle. 
There we go. Okay. I just unplugged the uh, the port and plugged it back in. And uh, so it's now just has that one MAC address. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to type in switch port. Oh, let me clear all this junk off. I'll type in switch port, port security, maximum, and then I'll type in sticky. And when I said sticky, I meant maximum. Uh, oh, I'm just losing it here. I'm sorry. It's port security MAC address sticky. I'm seeing that in the running config. It's blending together in my mind. Now watch what happened when I did that. I'm going to do a show run interface fast ethernet 0 slash 21. Let me squeeze the do command in front of that. And you can see I, it's got the command I typed in there. But look at that. It automatically hard-coded the first MAC address that it saw on that port. I'll hit the up arrow and it's it's right there. Now if I do a show start interface fast ethernet at 0 slash 21, oh, it doesn't let me use the interface command. Um, that It's not saved in the startup config is the point I'm trying to prove. So in order to save that MAC address, we have to do a save config, copy, run, start, or write memory. And that will allow you to save that MAC address to your startup config. Now watch this. I'm going to reach over and plug my Macintosh in here. Click. I just plugged my Macintosh in. I'm going to hit the up arrow and do a show run and uh, do it again. And one more time. Oh, where's my Macintosh? Let me do a show Mac address table interface fast season at 0 slash 21. <laughs> my Macintosh has died. Oh, are you kidding me? It just went into sleep mode. Sorry. <laughs> Let me. Let me move the mouse around. There we go. I moved the mouse around. Let me hit the up arrow. Oh, there we go. It's now back in the list. Um, I'm going to go into do the show run again. This is the point I'm trying to prove. I've got the sticky MAC address that has now learned a second MAC address, and I can save my config. How many MAC addresses will this feature learn? As many as I have set for the maximum here. So if I know there's only going to be two MAC addresses on this port, I'll change this over and say switch port, port security, maximum two and at that point it, I've already I've set the maximum to two and I've used the sticky command so the only two MAC addresses that are allowed on that port are these two you can see it's a calculated risk because if there is an intruder plugged into the network or a rogue device it will learn its MAC address just like everything else so of course the more secure way is to manually type in every MAC address however the more reasonable way to approach this is to use this sticky feature um, sometimes you know going on a port by port by port so you know what's plugged in or you could be brave and use the interface range command um, and just learn everything that's on that switch at this given point so that's your way of doing maximum number of MAC addresses per port and combining it with the secure MAC addresses. That's the idea behind configuring layer 2 port security in your network. So to wrap up, we talked about, first off, why layer 2? Because it's the commonly forgotten about road in your network that a lot of people forget to secure or even consider. We talked about a couple of the common or simple layer 2 attacks, the uh, man in the middle attack to spoof somebody else's MAC addresses, and of course the real simple MAC address flooding to try and fill the cam table on the switch. We talked about then configuring the port security, the vast majority of this video focused on that. First off, blocking a lot of the common attacks by limiting the number of MAC addresses per port, but second off, talking about setting static MAC addresses to restrict exactly what devices can access those ports. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.